Thank you guys for coming tonight. This is uh, another in a, hopefully what'll be a long series of cooking classes to help everybody understand what to do with uh, local fish and game that we have around here. Chef Wit here at Prep Kitchen is gonna help us learn how to take a whole halibut and use as very much of it as possible that we can use to uh, make sure we're not wasting any of the animal. Um, I wanna give you guys a few tips, tricks. Does anybody need help trying to find halibut? I can try to give as much help as possible. Yeah. All right. Ryan. Um, so halibut can be patterned fairly well. Um, and, I'll, and I'll preface this by saying that I learned all of this from guys in the club, but then also the Neptunes, I, they provided me with what's called their fish sheet. I got the fish sheet on halibut, which is those guys have been around for decades and there's some good information in there. I've been told and I have found in practice that it is almost pointless to look for halibut outside of a grunion run. People find them. Like, yeah, they'll find them, but typically, typically you'll notice outside of a grunion run, they're finding them and like stabbing them with a knife because they're not actually hunting them with the short gun or anything like that. So it's like, oh wow, there's one, I'm gonna take it and they get it and take it home. But when you're actually hunting them, really look for a grunion run. You can go online and just type in Southern California grunion run schedule and they, fall, they run on the full moon and on the new moon. The run time is at peak high tide or peak low tide. So instead of doing all that legwork to try to figure it out, there's plenty of websites that will tell you how to, when they're gonna run and they run like clockwork. So if it says they're gonna run Monday at 10 p.m., they'll show up on Monday at 10 p.m. However, they will show up to whatever beach they want to. So it's not like you can go into any random spot in Southern California and you're gonna be surrounded with grunion. Last night, Ryan and I dove. There's a grunion run last night. There's one and then it lasts for uh, three more nights. So tonight, Tomorrow and the next day will be the, the full grunion run. We and saw the super moon, the brightest moon of the year, and that affects them too. That does, yeah. That yeah. affects the halibut. The moon, the moon and the tides really affect the halibut, and it's because it's moving their food source around. So where I have always seen halibut is anywhere from three to four feet deep to like eight inches deep in the water. Um, sometimes I'll go out to like ten feet deep and look around, but I've never really seen anything there. I see them in the much shallower water. The reason being, and the only thing that I can deduce out of it, is if you imagine that they're there for grunion. The grunion, does anybody know why the grunion run? What are grunions? Little tiny yeah, silver okay. fish. Do you know why they run? The mate. Where do they spawn? On the beach. On the beach. So they're all swimming towards the shore, and they're all hitting the edge of that water, and they're accumulating on top of each other. So when they're further away from shore, they're more spread out and dispersed. When they get close to shore, they're now piled up, up, up on top of each other. The halibut have this really dense food source that they can uh, hide and jump up and just grab food at will. So you want to stay in that shallower water during the grunion run. Where do you look? You want to look near structure. So if there's rocks or something like that, um, you want to look in the sand and the, the near vicinity around rocks or in the very shallow waters along the length of the sand of the beach. In that shallow water, you'll notice that the waves will create sort of their own waves of sand underneath where you'll have a high point, a low point. Look in the low point, spend no time looking in the high point. Halibut, you can see how they're shaped. They've got these fins that come out that are sitting like this. They'll be sitting, like there'll be a high point, high point, and a low point, they'll be sitting down in there. They don't want to sit on the top because if that happened, the uh, water would sort of brush all the sand off them. Their fins would be flapping all over the place. They'd be really uncomfortable. So they're sitting in the eddy down in that low point of the sand. Um, once you've found them, make sure that on your, they have a 22 inch size limit. Make sure on your gun or whatever it is that you're hunting with, you've got some sort of gauge to know what that size is. They'll give you a couple seconds most of the time where you can kind of come up and just real gently, you know, don't act like a hunter, don't act like you're super excited and want to kill it because they'll know. Just sort of gently come up, move your gun or whatever you have to measure near it and say be like, yep, you know, that's legal before you pull the trigger because they'll give you two or three seconds to do that. If you come up from behind, these eyes will pivot and if they see you, they'll bolt that way. If you come up from in front though, I've also noticed a lot of times they sort of hunker down. So if you come up from in front of them and you're going slowly, approaching from the front also gives you the benefit of, if you imagine that you're on top of the water and you're seeing the halibut down below you, you're not pointing your gun at an angle this way. So as you shoot, that fish is, this fish that's shaped like this swims like this, he can't go that way. The only way he can go when he swims is that way. And if your spear is like that and he swims that way, guess what? He's now sliding up your spear and really screwing himself. If you come from this way and he tries to swim and your flopper or whatever it is that you're using to hold on to him doesn't open up, he's gonna swim right off your shaft 
and you'll more than likely lose him. More likely to bolt if you come that way too. Correct, yeah. They see danger coming from behind, I can get away. If they see danger coming from the front, they're like, ooh, I can only swim towards them, I don't want to get closer, I better use my camouflage and hunker down. If you either spook them or shoot them and they tear off, don't be too worried. I mean, yeah, it sucks, but they're not gonna go far. They'll maybe go 10, 15, 20 feet away is all. They'll give one quick burst, and also the way that, that they're shaped, again, they, they're swimming like this. They don't swim like this, like a fish, where a regular fish swims like that. He can turn right, he can turn left real easily. These guys get their propulsion like that, so turning right, turning left is really difficult for them, so they'll swim straight away. I mean, they may veer a little bit. You can start a circle pattern from where you saw them and just like swim in circles with a uh, widening radius around and around and around until you find them and nine times out of 10, you'll find them again. That also goes for if you're seeing small ones. If you're seeing a lot of small halibut, don't leave, halibut stick together. The smaller ones will stay with the bigger ones. So if you start seeing an area where you see a lot of smaller ones, circle the area, stay there, circle around, work the area, look in those low spots and typically the bigger ones will be there with the smaller ones. It didn't work out so well last night. I mean, we saw a couple dozen small ones and I found one that was just barely legal. It's just, sometimes it doesn't work out. Once you've shot them, braining these guys is really hard. Their brain is somewhere in there and I swear to God, it's the size of like a grain of sand. It's like 90 degrees back from that uh, that line, 90 degrees, so like right around like the center eye. Yeah, you know, that the top eye. Oh yeah. Like right in here somewhere. Oh, so sort of in the gill area? Yeah, kind of at the top of the gill plate. Mm -hmm. Come up and then turn 90. If you draw a line there, then 90, right around where it intersects the gill. That's good to know because right here, this little piece of the halibut, that's its cheek. That is a deli delicious part. So if you sit there stabbing around, you're gonna ruin that cheek. Take, we can take Ryan's advice and try to come up a little bit further here. Typically what I'll do to dispatch them is I'll cut their gill latch and they bleed out real quickly. So when you get when you cut the gill latch and there's that main artery opens up, their blood pressure is gonna drop immediately and they're gonna be out. They're gonna be not happy. They bite, halibut bite. And it hurts like hell when they bite. I don't know if you guys have ever seen, but they've got these big teeth. Yeah, so look at these like fangy teeth yeah, sort of things. Pretty fangy. Yeah, so I got bit once. I strung the fish before I killed it, thinking, ah, it'll die. No, it bit me. So <laughs> now I had a fish behind me biting me, and I had to find a way to get him back around. Oh, no. <laughs> get rid of him. Yeah, so any questions on how to find them? Say again? Full moon, new moon, run your run. So Shallow. yeah, actually you don't even have to worry so much about the full moon or the new moon. If you just look up the grunion run, it'll be on a full or a new moon. So yeah. Can you only find them with the grunion? No, 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 no. They are around. What yeah. I'm just saying is, is if you it's want a good indicator. If, yeah, in it if you are short on time and you're not able to, you're not someone who can dive every day of the week or even dive a lot and your time is limited, you're really gonna want to focus on the time you have the best chance for it. So your very best chance is finding the grunion. Oh, how do you find the grunion? Yeah, even simpler and stupider, moms like to take their kids to go and find grunion. And when those kids are flinging grunion around in their hands, they take pictures and put them on Facebook. <laughs> so you can go on Facebook to moms that you know that take their kids out and just say where they found them the night before. And the grunion will typically stay in a general area. So once the you've got that, that's a little bit of a secret way to find some intel on where they're gonna show up. Because no, no halibut diver is gonna tell you where they're finding the grunion. <laughs> Only the moms <laughs> on Facebook will tell you where to find the grunion. How deep do they get to go? So, they, I mean, they catch them on hook and line in hundreds of feet deep. When I'm hunting them spear, I'm honestly four feet to like eight inches deep. Like really in there, right behind the surf line. They will be in sort of the nastiness of, of the, the turning of the sand, but not as much if you stay right behind that. Not only that, that's where the corbina are also, the yeah. little like long slender whitefish that are really good eating. So if you're staying in that area and you're not finding halibut, you can always grab a couple corbina and they're really delicious to eat as well. When you're not, in my limited experience, but I've found a few halibut, um, not during the grinding run where you're coming into the shallows, along the reef areas, they're kind of in the nooks or the valleys between the reefs. So they're stalking. They're just waiting in the sand because they need the sand. And so you look for clean sand adjacent to a low reef and they're waiting for some small fish to come down off that reef. And like if this is the reef structure, they're right here, just sitting here like that. So swim around that area looking at the sand and you can see unusual shapes. Usually you'll see like 
Oh, yeah. The scallop the of the tail, yeah. or the edge of the fin line, eyes, or the two eyes popping out. So yeah, this guy, th this guy has been, you know, he's been dead a little while. But when they're alive, their eyes, eyes bulge, sort of like uh, Kermit the Frogs. Yeah, you'll see those eyes sort of bubbled up. Over yes, the, over I can see hand. two black dots that are, they're always going to be like two to four, three inches apart and about a half inch in diameter. You see two black dots like that. Pay attention and just scope it out a little bit. Yeah, uh, don't shine your light directly at them if you see them. If you sit, just like a lobster, if you're gonna sit there and point your light at them and say like, oh man, is that it? And you're shining directly on them, eventually they'll spook. So if you see, see what you think it is, move your, the, the focus of your light off to the side to where it's, you still have enough light to get an idea of what you're looking at, but not directly on them, you'll have a better chance of keeping them around. On Ryan's note of how you actually recognize them in the sand, a lot of times too, if the water's moving back and forth, you'll see this fin sort of get caught and lifted just the tiniest little bit and you'll see their silhouette. Like a break in that. You get that little undulated sand pattern and they're kind of linear and parallel yeah. and then you see a weird shape there. Just so they, they will catch it. you as you're looking at for hours and hours of sand, your eye will get trained where something's not right. And when something's not right, that's when you really slow down and say, I need to figure out what that is. And don't be like me. On well, my first halibut dive, I was like, I wonder if that's a halibut. And I like, went to like lightly tap it with my spear, and this just behemoth and boom, <laughs> swam away. So don't do that. Just spend a little bit of time and look at them. Yeah, so any other questions? More likely at night or during the day? I've seen them during the day, but more likely at night. They come in to feed at night. Yeah. All right, so once you've got them, now what do you do with them? you got to fillet them, right? <coughs> um, a halibut has four fillets. When you look at it here, so uh, this obviously is its stomach. This is its top shoulder. Right here, this line down the middle is its lateral line. So you've got a dark side and you've got a light side. Um, I've heard a lot of people say that they think that the light side is better tasting than the, than the dark. Maybe I don't have a refined palate. I've never noticed a difference. Halibut, since they live in the sand, um, there's a possibility of them getting worms in their um, intestines. Although they can be elsewhere, they're typically gonna be in the area where, like right around their uh, their gut area. So we're gonna work away from that. So the way that you start is we'll start by this upper shoulder. So they get the worms from the sand and not from what they eat? From what I understand, from what I've been told is they come up like and burrow through them. I heard that it was because they eat smelt. Okay. Oh, uh, and yeah. smelt are full of worms. So any fish that eats smelt will be contaminated. Okay. But Okay. All right, so we're gonna take this guy and we're gonna start at the upper shoulder here. And we're gonna make a cut all the way down to the lateral line. And we're gonna cut all the way down the lateral line, which is gonna put our knife directly on top of the spine. So right now, let's see, I think he's still a little frozen. So you can, I can feel the, uh, I don't know if you can hear it there, I was talking, but you can, you can feel the knife going over the vertebrae there. And then all you're gonna do is just sort of, with your knife at a slight angle, you're gonna work, put your knife right on the, those ribs there. You can hear him sort of rubbing across the... This guy's frozen, so yeah. a little bit. Oh yeah, thanks to Ron, by the way, for bringing this guy in. <laughs> Sorry, he's a bit frozen. It's okay. It's gonna go like that. And then we're gonna go away from the stomach here, so we're gonna move a little bit further down. We're gonna do the same thing, cut here. How do you know where the stomach ends? General idea. There's really no indicator on the outside of it. You just sort of get a rough idea. So like, I like to stay away from it because the last thing you wanna do is puncture its guts because then it releases nastiness. So I just say a little, I might lose a little bit of meat by staying away, but I think it's better to stay safer. And then again, it'll work. Do you want that cutting board too, by the way? Or do you rather do it on a sheet pan? Uh, cutting board's probably easier, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> so you went around the gut? Is that what you did? Yeah, that's this cut here. 
is to get away from the gut. See, he, you can see he's got a little bit of, a, of blood right there. That's yeah. right about where the, the gut cavity is going to start. There's a second one. So again, this is the round side. We'll take the skin off here in a second. All right, so now, same thing, start at the shoulder. Work down the rib. Work it all the way down the spine. And then again, we're going to miss the gut. And we're going to go right down. Um, so I think, Chef, I don't know how you want. Do you want me to let you break this down? We could even just throw it into a, a little sock pot and just kind of stack on it too. But. Halibut sashimi. So basically, the whole worm thing. So I don't know. Yeah. Like that's the thing. <laughs> so I would say you'd want to be to be assured that that anything would be killed. But so if this is frozen, yeah, the freezer overnight. Technically, that would kill off fridge. anything, right? I mean, that's what my understanding is. Yeah. Is that it would kill off anything? Do you know what you're talking about? Do you know a little bit about it? Yeah. Right. So you know, I just think if, if the fish is fresh enough and and then it's been in the freezer, so it's it's killed anything, then it should be good to go. But uh, you know, you didn't hear it from me. <laughs> Something goes wrong. <laughs> but if you want to show them, how to do it. Yeah. Well, I want you to do it. Yeah, I mean it's the best way to do it, and then that and and really the the more you practice, the better you're going to get on filleting, and then you might even get to a point where you don't even have that much to make uh, this great extra stuff from. Yeah. What are you trying to say? No, I didn't mean it that way. I meant like, <laughs> it was frozen too. That was the other thing. It was frozen. That's hard. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to take the carcass and then make a fish stock. Going to try and get all the flavor possible out of it. Hard, hard cavity. Yeah, it's yeah, it's, yeah. It's, but I mean, it's I mean, the same thing as this. It's this I, muscle here. Yeah. yeah. So it's easy to find. Yep. And then you the can, gills are gone. Yeah, gills and guts are gone. Okay, perfect. So then we'll just take it off. We've got the nicer, bigger pieces up here, so we can cut those into two pieces. But then we have this skinnier guy, so we got to figure out what to do with that one. I'm gonna go ahead and cut this into two pieces here. So these guys are the same thickness. So these will cook at about the same rate. But the problem is when these guys get to be thinner, it's going to cook faster. So what we're gonna do is decide where it starts tapering off and then we are going to score it and fold it and then it's gonna become a new thickness. But for this guy, we probably want to skin it. Wouldn't matter, but it's nicer if you do skin this type. So you get rid of the gills, obviously. Before We're going to use this for stock. But before you use it for stock, there's a lot of different recipes. So you could scrape off any of this flesh and then you could make like halibut cakes. You could make stuffings for salmon or not, some other fish. You could stuff the fillets with like a, a mixture as well. So there's a lot of ways. And the best way to do it is just to scrape it off the bone and then get this, all of this out. And then just a quick, you know, any crab cake recipe, just substitute the crab for this. Um, and then if you think about it, like at your sushi restaurants, all of that chopped up like spicy tuna or salmon or anything, that's all made from that. So they just take all the scraps and just mix it with mayonnaise and sriracha sauce and stuff it in a roll and call it, Good to go. call it dinner. So um, all of that can be done. Who wants to scrape bones? <laughs> then obviously Brad was mentioning about the cheeks. So the cheeks of any animal are edible. It's just a really nice piece of muscle that often gets forgotten. You've, what's really nice to look at when you get the whole fish is you have several meals that you can do. So you've, got, you've obviously got your fillets, which are gonna be your nicest choice, but you've got, you can make chowder, so you could get off any of these bigger pieces, or what you could do is you could pop this in your stock and then take it out and sometimes it's a lot easier to get all these pieces of meat off 
once it's actually been simmered a little bit. So if you're not going to make um, halibut cakes, but you are going to make like let's say halibut chowder or or some sort of a like a bouillabaisse or some sort of like a seafood type of a stew, you can just put your whole carcass in your pot with your aromatics, which is what we're going to do next. Like just like when you boil a chicken, you can pull off the pieces of chicken and then set aside the meat, and then you can continue to cook down the carcass and get more flavors out of the carcass. So there's that too. But yeah, so you've got the fillets, and then you've got a whole other meal of like a chowder style. Plus you've got to do cakes, like I was saying, fish cakes. So that's three meals in one fish, at least. Yeah, and then you can make extra of the stock, which will then you know help you for the next time. So basically what I like to do is suggest that if you're getting nice fish, you keep your stock stored up. So then whatever you're making that night, you don't rely on the stock that you're making that night. You rely on the stock you've already made and then you just kind of switch it up. So you don't have to worry about timing and like having it be a little stressful. You can enjoy your enjoy your night and then, you know, use your fillets or whatever and push push off to the side your scraps, make your crab cakes, your halibut cakes the next day and then have the time the next day to, to freeze your stock and get it set up. But um, pull out the stock you've already made and then it'll make your night a little bit easier and more fun. And then make your stock and then do it that way. It's just a little organization, but I think it's helpful cool. in terms of processing things. Thank you. You wanna have a nice long knife. So the idea is it's all in the angle of your knife. If your angle is too high up, when I'm trying to take the skin off, I'm gonna take off a lot of meat. If my angle is too far down, then I'm gonna cut straight through the skin and I'm then I'm gonna lose it and I'm not gonna be able to take the skin off. So it's, it's a lot easier to skin a whole filet than it is one piece. And um, you wanna start with the tail and um, it's all gonna be in a motion like this. And so what I like to do is, so I'm a righty and um, so I'm gonna use my right hand to skin and I'm gonna use my left hand to hold it. So I'm just gonna, get a little notch in to the fish right here, and that's going straight down. And before I cut through, I'm then gonna turn my knife like this, and this is where the angle and this type of skin, so I'm not used to halibut, so I'm not sure how the skin is gonna be, but every you're gonna learn how thick the skin is and how delicate it is, and um, so we're just gonna have some fun. So, and I'm just moving. So do you guys see that angle? And then you can just keep checking your work so you can see how much you're leaving or not leaving. And then just keep holding. You can just adjust your angle as you're going in. Totally, you can move your angle. I'm gonna move it a little bit closer to me and then just see what's going and on. also pay attention to how she has it off the edge of the table with the handle off the edge. Right, yeah. and that otherwise, over the table. if you, yeah. if right. you. Right, then you're not aligned. Yeah, yeah. the tilt lifts it up. Right? Yeah, because so. if I were to do it like this, I would be missing all that meat. Looking. Uh oh, that's a bad sign. Off the rails. Yeah, off the rails. So see what happens. If it gets too thin at a certain point, then you, you lose your grip and then you're kind of screwed. So start from this way. Oh, just pretend I don't know what the top from the bottom is. <laughs> and so this, I want to smooth it out because if my knife runs in anything, then that's just the. Filleting and skinning and everything is a lot easier on a fresh fish. And not to say that it's not, but one that hasn't been pre-frozen, you know, something happens to the proteins. They get a little bit softer, get a little bit beaten up. So when you have a fresh fish, this would not be as difficult. And then you can finish it up this way. But yeah. So that's the skin. See if that skin is make crackle. Yep. You can fry it. Crack types? Crack <laughs> <laughs> No, the Baja ships later in the year. Oh, okay. <laughs> now that we've got all of this. So on the other side, let me show you, there's bones that we want to get out sometimes. There we go. Okay, so now we've got our nice big thick fillets here. Yeah, I can smell the dessert. The dessert smells really good. <laughs> so I'm gonna go ahead and just score this right here. And then I'm gonna flip it. And then that's gonna be one piece like that. Nice. And then same with this guy. It's bigger. 
<laughs> this guy is gonna get scored and then there we go. So then that's bigger, thicker pieces that are gonna cook at the same time. So these guys we can pan sear, these guys we can do in the oven. Nobody will know that it wasn't one big thick piece. Sometimes like with a fish where, and it's, it's not gonna be this way with a halibut as much, but say like a salmon where you have a really big piece and then the other half is gonna be really thin. What you'll do with that is you'll just divide the thin piece in half and flip that up so it'll make the, the thin portion just as thick as the, as the thick portion. Do you have anything with like where it gets narrowed up back by the tail where it gets real sinewy or do you try to peel that off at all? Usually it cut, I mean, it's, it's just the nature of the flesh. So you might wanna take a little bit more of the tail and off or that's the type of meat that you would chop up and use for like your, your halibut cakes or like fritters so or something. Like yeah, exactly. Yeah. So if you cut it up and chop it up into smaller pieces, you won't lose it. If we want to do the vegetables though first, slice off the top and the bottom and then you peel it and then you make your dice whatever size you want or your slices or whatever. This is what you use for your food and then this is what usually goes away. But just like we're going to be re uh, usually utilizing the carcass, we're also going to utilize all of our scraps for our vegetables. So all this stuff you would just keep in a big um, bucket, kind of like what we have right there. Leave it in your refrigerator if you don't cook that often. Um, leave it in your freezer and then just keep opening your freezer door, popping these guys in, and then when your bucket's full, that's when you make your fish stock. So you can also freeze your carcasses. Um, you don't have to make it all at that same night. So get all that stuff. So the idea is you don't need to use a whole onion for this. You would use the onion scraps. Um, but tonight, since we're just for demonstration purposes, we're just going to use all. So same thing, any of your carrot peels, you would use the carrot, the peels of the carrot instead of using the whole carrot. Um, same thing with celery. If you, the, the top and the bottom, so the top and the bottom of the celery go into our stock. So there's the tops that we just trimmed off just because they get dry. Um, and the bottom, and I don't know what was wrong with these onions. I, they're, I guess they're in the stock pot now, so there we go. For whatever reason, they got in the pot. Anytime you chop parsley, so what you want to do when you chop parsley is get everything bunched together so you have all the leaves here and then you have all the stems here. Leave the stems on so that you can hold on to them when you're chopping them and then go ahead and chop them up. And then when you get to the stems, you just stop, but you have something to protect your fingers from chopping through them. And so then all these stems would go in as well. So you would leave the leaves to use um, in your sauces and your other preparations, and then you'd have the stems that would be in your stock. So all that stuff is gonna go into our fish stock. And um, the nice thing is that it cooks pretty quickly, so we don't have to um, cook it all day long. Basically about 30 minutes, be able to tell that it's, it's kind of given its magic up. So we're gonna pop the carcass in there. This one didn't come with the gut, okay. but yes, you definitely would not want the gut or the gills. Yeah, the gills um, just in the gut, they just make it bitter. So we just leave them out for that. Um, like sometimes people talk about the eyes making it cloudy. So lots of times you'll see recipes that, that say to go ahead and rinse off the blood, rinse off the, the stuff from the outside of the fish. But the one book that Brad and Fernando were showing that they were using, it's an Australian guy. The whole fish. Yeah, the whole fish. He's he's like a master of fish and, and using the whole fish and it's given you guys lots of ideas of how to use it. But what he's what he's saying in his recipes for fish stock, which I agree with, is that we want the flavor. The whole point of this is to have the flavor. If we just wanted water, we would just use water, but we would actually want the flavor of flavor, the fish. So why would we rinse off all the stuff from the fish? We're not gonna worry about it being cloudy because we're not claiming we're gonna serve a perfectly clear sauce. You know, we're gonna put shallots in our sauce. We're gonna put some flour and some butter to thicken it up. We're gonna put some wine and everything. So if it's, if it's a little not perfectly clear, we wouldn't notice it anyways because we're gonna be doing other stuff to it. So, so we're not gonna worry about some of those old school style French recipes that are really pretty outdated in terms of how, who eats them anyway. So, so go ahead, use the whole carcass. Don't rinse it, don't worry about the blood. It's all good flavor and it's gonna all add to um, the stock that we're gonna get, which is gonna make our sauce even better. And so the sauce that we're going to make is just going to be a very, very um, subtle, classic shallot, white wine, butter, fish stock sauce. 
So it's just going to be really clean and that way the flavor of the fish will really come out um, and it won't be overpowered by a lot of different stuff. So very subtle um, but using all the flavors of a fish. The one thing when you are going to pan sear a fish, so you have to have the proper tool and that's what I call them a fish flipper. You want to use it the right way. So you can see how it's uh, angled. So you want to use it upside down and the idea is you want to leave that piece of fish in the pan getting nice and crispy and brown and you need to leave it alone. If you try and move it before it's browned, you will basically never brown it because the only way that that fish is going to brown and get nice and crispy is if you leave it in contact with the pan, which is in contact with the heat. So what people tend to do is they put their food in the pan and then they want to touch it. So the more you touch it, the more you're going to loosen that seal, which is then going to cool it down, which means that you'll actually overcook your fish and never brown your fish. So um, you need to put it in, leave it alone, and not move it until it's completely brown on the one side. And actually, I would say it's nice to cook it 50-50, one half on one side and half on the other. But if you must, you can cook it more on the first side and then turn it over on the next side. So there's that thing too. But you want to use it upside down. If you use it right side up, you end up leaving a whole layer of the fish on the on the pan, which is no good. So you want to use it upside down, scrape underneath the piece of fish, and then turn it right side up and then use it that way. The other thing to think about is do you want skin on or skin off? Skin on, you can get the skin nice and crispy and then you know get all the different fish oils from the skin. So I would say go for it. Um, otherwise, if you're handy with the fryer, you can take the skin off and then you can fry the skin separately and then serve it kind of on the side. That's fine too, but, um, but like I said, I don't like to fry it. So you see how I just made sure that it was uh, unstuck? And then I'm gonna take my other one. This one gonna, or the spatula, sorry. So you wanna use these in twos. And then you flip it, and then you lay it down. And with that guy, so put it on my spatula. So that you don't have any uh, flare up. Yeah. Yeah, but it turns a little place on this. There you go. And we want to be careful. We do want to use oil, but we don't want to use too much oil. The too much oil is going to splatter everywhere and just become a mess and then catch on fire, and that's not going to be fun. No. And not enough oil, it's going to stick. So there's going to be like a really happy medium between the two. If you want to try and get your skin side crispy, which you guys have skin on yours, you can put your skin side down first. Where you guys don't have skin, so you would just put it down, right side down first. And then Ron, here's for you, so you can do that. So start preheating your pan. Oh, dude, it's so good. So good? Oh my god. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll, let you, I'll let you uh, find a seat and then I'll All right. just get some B roll. Getting some B roll. Yeah. Oh my god, thank you. Dude, that looks bomb. So pretty. Yeah. 
I need a we're all testimonial. Yeah, well, we're we have too much of everything. It's the best halibut I've ever cooked at this prep kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> you never have if you have. <laughs> what is that?